Uh, good afternoon, and thank you all for joining us. I'm Dr. Leah Shanley. I'm the co-executive director of the South Big Data Innovation Hub. For those of you who may not be familiar, the South Hub or and the Big Data Innovation Hubs generally, of which there are four, uh, were launched by the National Science Foundation to serve as a catalyst to help build and strengthen public-private partnerships that apply data science to real-world challenges. Uh, before we get started, I ask that those in your room uh, mute your phones. Uh, for those who are watching online, we ask you that you mute your mics so we don't have screaming babies or barking dogs throughout the panel. Uh, you can ask questions of the panelists when we move to that part of the, the program uh, by typing in your questions in the chat box. And uh, Carl will then uh, convey the questions to the panelists, and they will respond. Um, let's see. To tweet, those of you who are tweeting, SBDH for South Big Data Hub 17 hashtag or hashtag BD Hubs, and then you'll catch all the hub membership. Uh, so we welcome you to our South Hub Data Science Roundtable series. I think we're on number five or so of, of the series, or six. Uh, it's a monthly series that highlights the emerging research challenges in data science and identifies potential solutions. Today's discussion will focus on navigating questions of data management, data sharing, privacy, and more in order best to take advantage of the opportunities offered by the promising new field of immuno-oncology. Uh, I'd like to start things off by introducing today's moderator, Dr. Kimberly Robosky. Uh, Kimberly is a translational scientist and PI here at the Renaissance Computing Institute and an adjunct professor in the UNC Chapel Hill Department of Genetics. At the Renaissance Computing Institute, she supports best practices for cyber infrastructure and new business development, especially in the domains of biomedical and genomic initiatives. She received her PhD in bioinformatics from Boston University on a research fellowship from George Church's lab in the Department of Genetics at Harvard Medical School. And with that, I hand it over to Kimberly. All right, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, and welcome, everyone. Um, we are very, very pleased to have these three very distinguished panelists to join us today. And I'd like to introduce them to you. Dr. Benjamin Vincent in the center is an assistant professor of medicine in the Division of Hematology and Oncology at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Dr. Vincent was trained in cellular immunology and immunogenetics in the laboratory of Dr. Jeffrey Frelinger former chairman of the UNC Department of Microbiology and Immunology and past president of the American Association of Immunologists. Um, Dr. Vincent has also completed his research fellowship in the lab of Dr. Jonathan Sirotti, and he is currently a member of the Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center Immunotherapy Group, faculty director of the Immunogenetics Facility, and leader of the MP1U Preclinical Immunotherapy Program. So thank you, Dr. Benson, for joining us today. Dr. Joel Parker, um, to Dr. Benson's left, is a, the Director of Sequencing, Microarray, and Other Genomic Analysis for the Bioinformatics Shared Resource at the Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center. His research is focused in the methodological development and integrated analysis of high-throughput genetic and genomic studies. He previously led the development of algorithms that, um, and content that resulted in ProSigma, the only CE marked and FDI, FDA 510K cleared breast cancer diagnostic assay for FFPE tissue. So um, Dr. Parker is currently involved in similar diagnostic development in kidney and bladder cancer. So thank you also for joining us, Joel. And Dr. Vic. Wegman is the Director of Translational Genomics at Q Squared Solutions, a Quintel and Quest joint venture. Dr. Wegman leads the group with a goal of continued facilitation of preclinical drug development through biomarker uh, identification. Um, ongoing research resolves, revolves excuse me, around the genomic profiling of cancer using both DNA and RNA approaches including the development and deployment of robust assays that can be leveraged cl clinically as laboratory-developed tests or LDTs. Dr. Wegman brings more than 13 years of biomarker discovery research with genomics, and with the majority of those being dedicated to expression analysis, or EA, a Q-squared solutions company. Uh, Dr. Wegman has published 14 papers on biomarker identification and assay development, and has contributed to the development 
and launch of several genomic CLIA assays. And so without further ado, I would like to pass it over uh, to Dr. Vincent to give us some framing and in, an introduction uh, to the immunotherapy problem. Well, thanks, Kim, uh, for that introduction. We can go to the next slide. So this is a survival curve uh, showing the clinical data that really motivates our desire to use immunogenomics approaches uh, to understand responses in immuno-oncology. The y-axis here is overall survival uh, by percentage. The x-axis is time in months. The numbers at the bottom are numbers of patients in the various groups that are still being followed on the study. Uh, and so they all, in all of the groups, they start at 100% survive over time, and then as patients are lost to follow up or unfortunately die uh, from their disease or other causes, the curves, the curves go down. The three groups that you see there, colored blue, red, and green, are patients who have tumors where the tumor infiltrating immune cells are positive at two or three plus, barely positive or negative for what is, as of yet, the best biomarker of response to immunotherapy in any tumor, although I should say these data are from a large study in bladder cancer, probably the most robust uh, data we have so far. As you can see, the patients whose tumor infiltrating immune cells highly express this biomarker, which is uh, PDL1, they, uh, they do better. And so at 12 months, about half of those patients are still surviving. Uh, whereas there's only about 30% surviving uh, in the other two groups. Now that said, uh, the ex real excitement of immunotherapy is not only that it can extend survival from a bit for a bit in a number of patients, it's really that we get what oncologists are calling the tail on the curve, the leveling off uh, of a number of patients who have long-term durable remissions. You know, at five years, some oncologists may call that a cure. Uh, and so the challenge, the real challenge of the field is to understand why the vast majority of patients, even pdl one positive patients, uh, still progress and succumb to their disease, whereas a small minority get long-term durable responses. Can we understand that from pretreatment characteristics of the tumor, microenvironment from assays available from the blood, uh, et cetera? Let's go on to the next slide. The reason why genomics is attractive uh, in tackling this problem is that the tumor immune microenvironment, uh, shown here in cartoon form, uh, form on the left panel, is highly complex. It's a mixture, a dynamic equilibrium of competing and reinforcing cell types with many various functions, all of them communicating with one another. And then the cancer immunity cycle shown on the right panel is equally complex. This is the series of events that have to happen for a T cell to recognize and kill a cancer cell. Reading from the bottom left and clockwise, there has to be cancer cell death of some kind, either natural turnover, chemotherapy, radiation, immune attack. It then leads to the elaboration of antigens that can be picked up by antigen presenting cells, migrate to the lymph node, prime naive T cells, leading to T cell clonal expansion and activation, then those T cells, which can potentially react and kill tumor cells, have to get back into the circulation, traffic to the tumor, achieve ingress into the tumor immune microenvironment, find the specific target tumor cells, and actually achieve killing. And at each one of those steps, there are multiple layers of molecular regulation and Public and private entities are looking at ways to augment anti-tumor effects at, at each one. So the reason that genomics is attractive is because genomics can allow us to see that complexity out of one or a small number of assays in a way that we can't do with traditional functional cellular immunology techniques, which largely require live cells. So to robustly develop biomarkers to respond to immunotherapy, I think we need two things. We need to be able to assess the complexity of the immune microenvironment. We need to do that in a way that's accessible from FFP or formal and fixed paraffin embedded tissues because that's the way that most samples are archived for 90 plus percentage of the patients, even at academic centers. Next slide. 
So what is immunogenomics or genomics applications in immuno-oncology? Well, it's classical genomics like mutation detection, copy number variation detection, gene expression profiling, uh, all on top of immune-specific genomics assays like HLA type identifications, T cell receptor and B cell repertoire identifications, and then modeling approaches to take all of those features, classical genomics and immunogenomics features, and try to associate them uh, with outcomes and separate the signal from the noise in order to develop uh, biomarkers of response versus resistance. And with that, I'll transition to the next speaker. Thanks, Ben. So that was a great introduction. And, and your point there that we have to have this integration of multiple biomarkers in order to really power these trials it, what I want to show is that, that that's possible, and I have a few examples of how we've used um, a large number of variables and, and taking those into account in proper context in order to model them in such a way as to give clinical decisions. So next slide, please. So in some of our early work, we developed a, a, a classification device for breast cancer that was relying upon the expression of 50 genes. And measurement of these 50 genes, and you can go ahead and click the next one to, to get, the, get it in, is really simply looking at an, a new sample and profiling it for these 50 genes and saying what is it most similar to from what we know. And when, once we classify a sample in this way using this multivariate approach, we can provide some assessment of its not only its subtype but also its prognosis, so how well that individual is going to, to uh, or how long that individual is going to survive in the absence of any therapy. And on the top right, what we found was that that producing this continuous score was actually very, uh, a very strong uh, and accurate predictor of relapse-free survival. What we're showing there is the, is the linear relationship between the score that's provided to clinicians on the x-axis versus the probability of survival on, at five years on the y-axis. What we also found is that using data in this way was, was much more accurate than any clinically-based diagnostic that was currently available. So taking things into account, shown in the bar plot is tumor size by T, ER status is the ER and grade, and we can do our best job of modeling these data, but it's still nowhere close to the accuracy of the genomic-based predictions, which are shown in the later bars, with the, the x-axis there being accuracy in determining the risk of relapse. Next slide, please. Next slide. So, so this was commercialized into a test called ProSigna. And ProSigna commercialization turned this into a very easily interpretable report for the clinician so that they can take this highly complex genomic measurement um, that is evaluated with a computational model and then project that back to the clinician in a very easy to interpret form. And so on the top left, you simply get a score, which is, which is this risk of recurrent score, and it can be used, be, be used to classify patients into low, intermediate, or high risk. And again, there's this, linear, there's this continuum, which tells them not only about this categorization, but on the bottom right, the actual probability of relapse at a given time point, given their continuous score. Next slide, please. So that, that um, technique was FDA approved, and it's been distributed, and it's been started to be used to analyze samples that are in numerous clinical trials. Here's an example of one clinical trial led by Lisa Carey at the University of North Carolina which was actually a negative trial in that they used combinations of different, uh, of different Herceptin inhibitors uh, or HER2 receptor inhibitors in order to look for uh, in response to, to, in order to look for response in this particular subset of patients we call uh, HER2 positive by a single IHC marker. However, by subtyping it this way, what we see is that we get an enormous increase in the response rate. So on the top left, are those three drug combinations. And while they, they is, there is some variation, there was no statistical difference between the three arms of the trial. However, on the bottom right, we get a significant interaction with those that are subtyped as the HER2 enriched group, that's the genomic marker instead of the single protein. This is the multivariate genomic marker. Now we're getting pathologic complete response is what our, our outcome is here. That means after the drug is given, the surgeon is going in and looking for tumor and there's none left. So this is as close to a cure as we can get in a short time frame. And 70% of the patients that receive this drug and are in that subtype achieve that result. Next slide, please. 
So in other work, we're, we're, we're extending this work and looking at other drugs and using genomics to develop these models of subtype. And we can show repeatedly. Here's with a, another drug called enzalutamide. It's an androgen receptor antagonist. It was approved in prostate cancer. And the thought was that there was some subset of breast cancer patients which may also be sensitive to this drug. Of course, it wouldn't be many because it's androgen and not estrogen receptor. But using genomics, we can actually find that subset of patients who don't express estrogen receptor. Instead, or androgen receptor may be driving their breast cancer. And the result is this drug works very effectively in that small subset of breast cancer patients. And so using the genomic-based biomarker, PREDICT AR, up here on the top left, we highly enrich for those, those patients that are sensitive to the drug, as opposed to a single protein marker, IHC, which would be used in the clinic right now and on the top right. So in this case, we increase our sensitivity by 10%. Our positive predictive value by 10%, that is the patients we predict to be sensitive to the drug are actually responding to the drug, and also increase our negative predictive value. That is, we're more accurate at, at, at not giving the drug to people that, uh, that will not respond to it. And next slide, please. And so the result of this work, again, a multivariate signature that was built in research space, taken into the clinic, is, will, will be a phase three trial where the biomarker is going to be entry in criteria into the trial. And this will get, provide us definitive answer as to the enrichment of this uh, uh, based on the biomarker. The beautiful thing about this particular test is that these triple negative breast cancers typically get chemotherapy, all right? And you, if you all heard, chemotherapy is not too good for you, right? Whereas enzalutamide, the drug that we are going to give in, in, in uh, in substitution for chemotherapy for these diagnostic positive patients is a hormone agent where only 10 percent of patients even have uh, grade 3 fatigue so not only will we go to the next slide please essentially double their lifespan for those bi biomarker positive patients but they're going to have a much better quality of life and this is really the promise of genomics that we can take these high dimensional measurements distill them down into some clinically actionable result and that clinically actionable result is something that we can do right now because we're taking a drug that's already approved and giving it to the patients that, that are accurately needed. And the result is, is shown here that in this particular cohort, the median survival is 32 weeks for those that are diagnostic negative. Those that achieved or that are diagnostic positive achieve 75 weeks of overall survival and they're not even getting chemotherapy. It's a single agent hormone therapy. So this is what we want to be able to do with the immuno-oncology space. But it, the problem is even, is even larger because while this is just looking at tumor genomics, as Ben just mentioned, we now have to incorporate tumor genomics as well as all the microenvironment in order to see this kind of result. And, uh, oh, so this was just the summary slide uh, showing that while we uh, gave you a few examples within a few different disease subtypes of breast cancer, that in the larger cohort of all breast cancer, this kind of result, it, by developing a gene expression based or general genomic model, commercializing it has produced results for all of breast cancer. And, and because of that, we're seeing improved survival across the entire spectrum of breast cancer. So thanks for listening. Now I'll pass it over to Vic. All right. <clears throat> so yeah, that's, this is a really good setup because uh, immunology is hard. Understanding how immunotherapy is, is even harder. And as we've kind of got a crash course in this, you can go next slide. Um, by the way, I'm so glad that I switched out my slide last minute for the tumor microenvironment for this one, so that way we don't double up on the same one. <clears throat> but since we've already gone over a lot of this, I at least wanted to touch for the people that's not uh, familiar with, is what we like to hope uh, when we get a disease or any other kind of affliction, our immune cells respond to it. We get sick, you know, we kind of feel crummy for a little while, immune cells are building up, uh, ability to kill the whatever that's not you, uh, and it immediately goes away. So it shouldn't be too far removed to think about if you get a cancer, which is, which is a disease, which is definitely not you, um, that your immune cell actually responds in that fashion. If you can imagine, if you actually have a heightened response, you should have better survival. And the figure in the bottom left here, by the way, the brown uh, stain, and I'll, I'll uh, show myself for taking pictures of pictures, you can see it's a little blurred out. Um, the brown here are the, uh, the cytokeratin markers that are highlighted here in the red. Um, the red, so we got CD3, CD8, Fox P3. Uh, so in this particular uh, paper from Halama et al., uh, you have a liver and it's appropriate metastasis, and you got your margin here in the red. 
when you actually get the tumor cells to actually start responding, kind of, uh, the progression-free survival for this patient is not so great. You know, your, your body is not responding it as an immediate danger. Although when you've got immune cells giving a very strong response, and by the way, this is, you know, I wouldn't say old school, but very low throughput. I mean, images are big data, but they're, you know, just about one picture for one thing. Um, how do we really know what's going on here? Why does this patient's immune system respond versus this one, even though they both have colorectal cancer? That's, that's really the tough part. And when we get to this tumor microenvironment, which is not just the tumor in the top figure here that's in the beige, but all these different cell types that are just sitting around doing what they're supposed to do or not because the tumor has evolved enough to where the recognition pathways don't exist as we would like them to. If you go to the next slide. Um, yeah, this, this involves all the things you're not supposed to throw on a slide, but I'm, I'm doing this to a point. So uh, immune therapy obviously is very important. You guys have seen it on the cover of magazines. People are talking about it wildly. Uh, it's in NPR all over the place. Um, <clears throat> and of course, coming from a clinical trial uh, organization, we know a thing or two about what trials are being held for what immune therapies. So in this figure, as you go radially out, each pie slice is a type of cancer. Melanoma, non-small cell, renal cell, skin, colon, and as you go outward, you go from your large phase threes to your small phase ones. And every dot here is a particular therapy or combo therapy uh, for those that are, that are yellow. But why that's important is you have all these trials going on with all these immune therapies, primarily on, as, as, as both speakers already mentioned, you know, uh, PD-1, pd one That's one marker. So having lots of trials based on one marker, as we've learned and, and, and explored more about uh, PD-1, it's not necessarily the best marker. And as Joel showed in kind of uh, uh, getting the pro signa and the uh, combined gene expression, leveraging the fact that genomics can provide you multi-analyte testing provides you a much more robust response. So what we're learning from these trials that we're only running one type of analyte testing, uh, we're missing the mark. Patients aren't getting that nice leveling off that this immune therapy is, is uh, promised to do. Next slide. So. There's some thoughts here into uh, what all things we test in the immune system and the immune response to that tumor. Can't go over all the slides, so I want at least uh, all the material here. Uh, it's a cancer immunogram that was pushed out. But the reason why I, I show this here, um, so given I come from a, a clinical testing organization, we actually have uh, testing strategies for all these types of items, whether there uh, is the tumor riddled with mutations, uh, is tumor, are tumor cells actually seeing the immune system present in there? Are they actually getting you know, deep into the cell to start killing the root of these items? And as we get around to these questions, we want to know about how the immune system responds to that tumor. There's all kinds of testing that are available. Um, the ones in blue are ones my specific lab does, and the ones in green are the, the larger global laboratory structure. But there's lots of ways to do this. And um, as was mentioned earlier, a lot of them are relying on live cells, which is very difficult to get. I mean, yeah, you do a blood draw, that's live cells, but normally when we get the tumor, they're in FFPE or you get this big mass. It's a lot harder to do these things. So the idea of a one test, one fit for immune therapy is just, we're not there. And as, as clinical trials are coming, if you go to the next slide, as a matter of fact, they're starting to come alive. Um, I, I, every time I, I show these kinds of slides, I have to do more research because so many more clinical trials are uh, uh, showing up, trying to get at what the, how the immune system is responding. This is some work I did back in November, um, manually reviewing uh, clinicaltrials.gov because it was too hard to, um, to find some magic query path that gave me everything that I needed. So I just did old school like the biologist in me would. Uh, but while that's really important, uh, you can see what study type, are you just observing patients, are you actually intervening with drugs? Um, I will say, you know, is, the immune, is something in the immune system a primary outcome measurement? That's this slide right here. Uh, is something um, in the immune system a secondary income, yes or no? And then on the right here, are we actually measuring something besides one tip one marker? Now, if you guys have ever played around with clinicaltrials.gov, which is a hoop, <clears throat> Um, the descriptions are anything from meticulous and well thought out to, oh my God, I'm meeting up with some friends at 4.30, I've got to put out these five sentences in the, my description before I go catch them up at the bar. Um, so they're really, really wildly different about what's going on in these trials. 
So let's take the first one here for prostate cancer that's recruiting. I've got the codes. And I've got the whole list of these 80 some odd trials uh, in, in a different publication. But you know, here we're going to measure, measure T cell diversity as by T cell repertoire deep sequencing. All right, tells me the drug, tells me T cell. That's great. And there is a whole slew of what we haven't introduced here of all the different types of markers for what that is. And I will bring it up in my last slide. OK, cool. We're going to get a lot of different measurements about how the T cells, the cells really getting in there and doing the killing, um, uh, how they're responding. OK, cool. What are we going to do in this CLL study? All right. Uh, maybe it has immune system in its primary outcome. Definitely not in its secondary. The primary one is cell surface antigens. Great. Which ones? Antigens. Uh, so it makes it really tough to kind of figure out exactly what complexity of data we could potentially mine to get at this kind of stuff. And the reason why I'm setting all this up is that big data is great when it exists and well characterized and organized. And by the way, I'm sure this is a lot of preaching to the choir, but in the clinical trial realm, that is not a consideration that is going on most of the time. Um, in this last study here in lymphoma, as just an example, this is extra explicit. We're going to look at minimum residual disease, or MRD, um, assessed by T cell with this uh, clinically available assay. Hooray! I know exactly what's going on. Yes, it is indeed in genomics. And by the way, it's something they're exploring. By the way, we're not using this data to actively get people on these drugs. Um, while some of them exist, they're not a lot. I mean, even here in this, this inter, it's an interventional study, so obviously based on some testing, they're going to get a drug or they're not going to get a drug. But in this case, it's not going to be related to anything about their immune system. They're going to sit and watch. So that's kind of where we're at right now in the sitting and the watching phase in my last slide. Um, now I'm going to show the evolution of, of how this kind of testing comes along from our laboratory. Here is, uh, and I will say uh, I have a uh, uh, not full, complete information about all the, the older school testing mechanisms. But uh, as we do PCR, and this is 107 different primers from a 2003 paper, uh, you run all those primers together, you look at how their kind of size distribution sets, and you have the same patient doubled up, so you make sure you get a consistent response. And you kind of say, yep, those squiggles are totally different than those squiggles. There's less of them here. There's less immune cells that are different here. So clearly, it's, it's not so different. And of course, we love the gels, right? Very highly resolved, as you can tell, from schmear to kind of schmear with some dots. Um, makes it very hard for like actually something as resolved as what Joel had mentioned, because uh, depending on what picture and camera you use, you might be getting different intensities of this kind of stuff. And depending on how good your fragment analyzer is, or how you know consistent your protocol is, these squiggles may uh, may may shift. So uh, this is when it's really diverse and very healthy. This is when it's not. So diverse is in your immune cells, sees all kinds of stuff, like that big dark black mass from earlier. Uh, and here's one that's, the uh, immune system is not really doing really well. Um, so you got between these two controls, something in the middle, something close to the end. OK, that doesn't really work out so well. Uh, as far as a something we can mine, measure, go back and forth with, uh, maybe there's you know fancy computers that can look at the image recognition. But uh, we all like nice tables here with you know, exactly, uh, CDR3 is a recognition sequence on the tumor antigen. Uh, we get to know what kind of frequency we see this specific sequence, how many counts we get, um, how many actual non-normalized counts that we get. So we're actually starting to get expression of the different antigens from uh, the, the T and B cells here in a way that we can actually kind of consistently measure. Um, and as we said, we went from 2003 to 107 different primers to now 25,000. So automatically, we've exploded just consistent, you know, pretty substantially about what we're measuring from the T cell receptor. And of course, now the trials are starting to come out. There are now, uh, last I, I heard, at least at ACR last week, was maybe like 150 trials in immune therapy that are using some marker. Um, I couldn't look that up. It's really hard to mine uh, clinical trials. But we're starting to see these things. But the question is, how are we actually going to be able to leverage this data? How is it actually going to be created in the first place in such a way where we can start understanding how the immune therapy is responding to these patients? That is, it's almost like we revisited or re-engaged gene expression profiling you know, 15 years ago. So it's getting really difficult to mine this. And not only that, as I mentioned, if the trials aren't describing things very well, I will say from playing this space, the data organization isn't so hot. 
so there is there's a lot of, of room to grow in that space, although the data is voluminous enough to really kind of lead that charge. And I will end on that. So some Easter egg slide. Well, thank you. Uh, that was fantastic, wonderful whirlwind introduction to the problems around immunotherapy. And I think some of the takeaways are there's loads of data. It's kind of messy. It's not well organized. There's, Very messy. We really need lots of different assays, and we have to figure out how to integrate all this information. Um, and so I think there's much opportunity for uh, for data scientists to jump in and, and help save the world with you guys. Uh, because the, the really exciting thing about immuno oncology and, and immunotherapies is the results that are being seen in the clinic. And I'm sure everybody's familiar with the story of uh, President Carter and how he responded um, in his, uh, having brain cancer and his tumors going into full remission as a consequence of immunotherapy. Um, okay, so I guess one question I'd like to ask you, we saw the immunogram, um, we saw kind of a number of different assays that we could be using um, to measure these things. Um, Dr. Vincent, what would you say would be some of the primary things that need to be measured moving forward? Maybe can you talk to us a little bit about you know, what is being measured today for these things and what other things need to be added right away and maybe longer term? You know, give us some sense of what you would like to see sure. working in the clinic. From a genomics perspective, I think we think in terms of the base level assays and then the analytics. So from base level assays, we can get a lot out of RNA sequencing alone. But if you wanted to say what's the, what's would you have if, you know, in your dreams but actually reasonable to do, um, it would be RNA sequencing, whole exome sequencing, and T cell receptor and B cell receptor, amplicon, amplification, and, and sequencing. I think those, those three sets of things are, are doable at a decent cost structure uh, and can give us a huge wealth of information. But on top of that is the analytics are, I think, more complicated than, than classical genomics. And so that's the sort of the next layer is you need analytics to actually fish out the immune signal from the tumor signal, in, especially in the RNA sequencing data. And then you need sophisticated modeling approaches like what Joel has described in order to, to essentially build your biomarker model or your model that will be a biomarker from a large number of, of features at, you know, at each level deciding what's, where the orthogonal information is, what to include, what to exclude, and so on. That's, that's also a difficult problem. So maybe there's three layers. There's the base assays. Then there's the analytics to get the base level char immune feature characterizations out of those assays. And then there's the advanced modeling to test and build the biomarker. And so when you uh, talk about uh, performing these assays, I presume you're talking about on the FFPE tumor tissue? On DNA and RNA derived from FFP and samples. Then, and That's then right. that doesn't even touch what you would want to do with normal because I heard you say also you need to be able to compare that to the, the normal immune environment. And I would presume you'd probably want to do it in multiple spots in the tumor, or do you think it's sufficient to? Uh, if, if we had a choice, we'd want multiple spots. In fact, it, late last year, there was a wonderful article in Science about heterogeneity and expression of tumor antigens across different geographical, geospatial, or spatial regions in a tumor. Uh, and so you may get different answers about what the tumor target space is if you're trying to predict that um, from one versus another. Yeah. So, multi so this, this is actually a place where uh, a genomics result may inform clinical biopsy strategies. Because right now what happens if the tumor is large enough is the radiologist or the interventionalist who is getting core biopsies with a long needle will just get in sort of a piece of an arc, they're getting four biopsies, one, two, three, four. Well, people are starting to consider actually requesting more heterogeneous biopsy strategies because some of these studies are coming out about intratumoral heterogeneity in gene expression, including antigen expressions. Okay. 
And then for me, I find the hard part to follow up on that is actually getting that in the trial protocols. You mentioned the, the RNA-seq exome and T-cell receptor. Over the last year and a half, you know, our, our trials that are testing for exome and RNA-seq have exploded to, you know, several thousand or tens of thousands of patients that are getting those two things done. The T and TNB is too expensive now for everybody to start doing, but I'm just glad, glad in the secondary arena they're starting to understand the value of that data, but the, the funny part is is that when we try to deliver that data, they're like, okay, go ahead and put it in the database. What do you want in the database? The RNA-seq data. What about it? We want all of it. I just send the files like, well, we can't have 80,000 columns in our clinical trial databases. What do we do? Because they're used to this, you know, we were expecting PD-1 and CTLA-4. Can't, don't you have that? It's like, well, yeah, we have that and 79,996 other ones. Um, so it's been really difficult. We've spent a lot of uh, lag time in the, in the data arena just getting people understanding what that information is because the PIs and the clinicians know, but the people on the back end are used to status quo type testing, and that makes it really tough to do this biomarker discovery. So, so that begs the question then, what can clinicians use for trying to interpret some of this data? And, and, and also, you know, how can they be assured that that, that the results that they're getting are uh, the highest quality. Do you have any thoughts on that, Vic? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it depends on how much people study understanding what the assay that's used to generate that data does. And in any kind of, we get audited all the time, and of course for UNC, I would imagine in, in testing in an isolated arena, you understand how the sequencing group works. You understand how the samples go through Joel's pipelines. You know, you, you, you can follow that kind of chain of custody, but that's not always done everywhere. Just because all these trials, and you look at the places that are doing these testing, they're everywhere. So having a, a single way to follow all that information that the patient data you're looking at is the right one is actually a very difficult problem. Um, so controlling that, having standards for how lab, you know, your CAP and CLIA accreditation is a great way to, to, to filter these kinds of things out. Um, and then getting into the interpretation, oh man, that is, yeah, this is, there's no wand waving. It'd be like, ah, it was that antigen that I had up on there, that six, you know, string of 60 bases, that's the one that responds to the therapy. You know, yeah, I don't, don't know how you do that. That's the rub, trying to take all this information and, and integrate it and record it and, and potentially even share it with other biomarker developers, which, you know, is a whole other can of worms. Well, do you have any comments about that? How you yeah, absolutely. So this thing? is, um, I mean, the real the, kind of the new challenge with immuno oncology is is that is that you want to integrate these different features. Uh, whereas prior with with you know the, the biomarkers that I described earlier, these are all you know we we consider them as all just tumor markers, and and while, while they are voluminous, it's you know. Typically, simple linear-based strategies of modeling will will allow us to produce a very directly interpretable result. Um, however, the when we go to immuno oncology, because we need to integrate these different uh, components, being the tumor and all the different components of the microenvironment, we have to consider interactions between them. And as soon as we talk about interactions, the combinatorics get extraordinarily large. And the combinatorics are already hard when we were just looking for, for linear effects. And so, so not only do, do, does our combinatorics blow up, but at the same time, we want to condense it back down. We need you know, really good ways of condensing the, that information back down to, simply, to simplify interpretation. So here are the cells that are present. Here, of those cells that are present, here's the ones that are active, and in what way that they are active in this particular sample. And, and so we have to reduce all this data with the knowledge of interactions back down to these simple phenotypes that we know exist and we know um, are part of the, the tumor killing or not. And, and so until we can get enough samples to understand the combinatorics and to understand it at the genomic level to a point where we can reduce it back to these simple phenotypes and produce a clinically interpretable result, it's, it's just going to be very challenging. Need more data. Yeah, and I'll say, I mean, but, but even then, getting into that phenotypes, if we go back to the, the figure of, not that we have to, but go back to the figure of the tumor microenvironment, I mean, now, I mean, you got, uh, actually, I didn't put the slide in here on the assumption that you two might, might have it, but 
actually the gene expression signatures that are immune cell specific, we can actually start saying we have CD8 here, we have CD4 here, we have memory B, really at a basal level, but at least we can start characterizing each of those set immune cells and ideally hope, you know, a it's there, it's active, or it's we don't see it at all. And maybe you know, getting to the pathology and the staining, something that's a lot more robust and automatically dimensional reduction becomes much more tangible. I've not seen, you know, quite to that predictive level yet, but I know there's definitely papers existing uh, to help with that process. And I think we have a question from Yes, a remote participant has a pair of questions that are related. What are the key privacy challenges in this type of research, and how have you addressed these challenges? Joel may be better able to speak to this than me. I think you probably understand the, uh, the architecture a little bit better, but I, I think we, you know, we are very careful to store sequencing data in HIPAA-compliant ways. So UNC takes the approach, there's kind of two schools of thought about genomics data and privacy. One school of thought is uh, it's not, it's not pers if it's not whole genome sequencing, it's not personally identifiable data, thus I can do with it whatever I want, put it on my laptop and you know, whatever. There's another school of thought that says essentially any NGS data, including you know, exome variant, pat derived variant patterns, is potentially personally identifiable and so should be behind the HIPAA wall. And that's the approach at least that, that, that we take at Lineberger. Oh, yeah. So we have a lot of, a number of protections in place. Um, I, again, I don't know exactly how the, you know, yeah, but yeah, Joel's yeah. group has set up an entire architecture to accomplish that for us. Yeah, I mean, we've tried, but uh, <laughs> the, you know, the, um, I mean, I think there was a cover of The Economist this past week that said something about nothing on computers is ever safe. And, and, <laughs> and so, uh, so I think we all have to bear that in mind. You know, ultimately, lock the door. that's right. <laughs> ultimately, you know, our DNA is, is our identity. Um, there's nothing more identifiable than the DNA. However, in order to make it identifiable, it, it requires that you go out and have something that I know is you and test it and compare it, right? And so, so, you know, the HIPAA regulations right now are taking the, the stance that it's not identifiable because you would have to go resequence someone, and that's is, is reasonable. However, I don't think it's going to be too far in the future before, before such technology is, is very amenable to me finding, you know, whatever it is, a piece of your hair or skin flakes that allow us to be identifiable. So I, I think it's a short-lived stance. Um, but at the same time, we, we try to be more conservative in our in our uh, in our stance at, at UNC. I think since you talked to the data part, I'll talk to the clinical part. Perfect. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> Too, which is that you know a lot of privacy is also considered upfront in the consent, right? Mm -hmm. And and I think what we're ha really having trouble with right now is is that uh, you know as you know we were in this discussion the other day about consents from historic studies where we have banks and banks of FFP tissue, which we now have technologies to completely unlock, and they have years of outcome and clinical data available, but they were not consented in the way in which we can assay that information correctly, right? Many of these people are maybe have now died, and what do we do? Plus, because it's DNA, um, that, that information, you know, has relevance to their families. It's not just them or their tumor. Um, and so we have to be very careful with, with how we approach those things. And, you know, it may be, uh, I think this is a real challenge, actually. I, I don't want to be optimistic or pessimistic, it's, but there has to be a way that we can unlock that um, while still having some respect for confidentiality and, and uh, what they consented to, what the patient consented to when they entered the study. And, and I'll add to this on another clinical level for the trial testing and other items like this. So when you know, a person contracts with us to run a specific test, for their trial or whatever testing we're doing, um, when you sign out for that particular test, a box arrives to that provider that already has sample collection materials and things like this pre-barcoded with an anonymous ID. So where my organization is holding under lock and key that identifier <clears throat> database. So once that data leaves the hospital and comes to the testing lab or where testing labs plural. Um, they're only known as that barcode ID as far as a privacy entity is concerned. And so one of the larger parts of our business is actually maintaining that 
uh, sample sourcing security aspect in the clinical databases that then we would share back with uh, uh, through very private uh, means, encrypted means, uh, back to the, the clinical trial site and the physician about the result of that, that person. So even my, my team, when we get a sample in, process it, we know it's a sample ID. Once we upload it back to our delivery portal, that's when the delivery portal can read the barcode, slap the patient ID back on, and go back to the trial site. So we never even have access or knowledge of those kinds of things. And yes, of course, as far as the computer infrastructure is set up, the monitoring of every single person, even our robots, uh, on that system is completely locked. Every single file made was by this person at this time, logged into version control, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of things in place. That and that's part of the requirements for CLIA validation for these tests. And especially when you're making diagnostics and other things like that, this is mandatory. Yeah. All right. Well, that's kind of that opens, was a two-parter, right? Yeah, that opens more questions, probably too. Is you know how does how does one try to be foresighted by consenting for long-term research, and also um, how can you be foresighted in terms of anticipating what will be called PHI with regards to genetic information in the future? And I think that's a really good, very important point. That Anticipate that today, those kinds of changes. We've integrated now into our tissue banking specific consents for genomic studies with the recognition that it's identifiable, potentially identifiable material. And so going forward, I think we're okay. But to Joel's point of what about the tissue bank that started in 1997 and has a thousand samples in it? Right. Um, I mean, you we haven't solved that. I mean, it, it, and just to say, like, what a valuable resource that is if it takes any additional statement. The initial slide I showed on making getting that biomarker approved by the FDA it was because we could run it on FFP tissue. And so we were able to run that biomarker on, uh, on retrospectively collected trials that already had 15 plus years of follow up. So in that way, we already, you know, the trial's already done, the data, the samples are already there, the 15 years of follow-up are already there, so we can immediately take it to action. Um, and that, that's where the real value is. Otherwise, no matter what you know, your great hypothesis we come up is, with is right now, it's going to be that long before especially these long outcome cancers like breast cancer can have any action taken on them. So then I, I think maybe the flip side of that question is, um, you know, you have the, the data, they're not broadly consented in some cases, and you have multiple um, teams uh, from different uh, pharma companies and what have you kind of running the race to see who can get the biomarker. How do you share data to uh, facilitate this and fuel, fuel discovery? Um, you know, is there, what kind of data can you share, and how can we incent organizations to um, for this kind of uh, data sharing while at the same time respecting privacy and consenting and IP and all these other things. Anybody have any comments on that? Well, that's part of what the data comment is supposed to do, right? I'm looking over at Joel as someone who tests it. Well, I uh, who probably touches it more than I do. For public data, but I mean, all the, you know, all these, all these former run trials aren't going to see the light of day in those, in those nope. data banks. They right? sure don't. And so I think, that <laughs> speaking to what Kim said about incentivizing them, I think as more and more trials come out where they see that their particular drug has no great effect <laughs> in a general selection process, but with a biomarker in place, now all of a sudden they increase that positive predictive value. And that positive predictive value, what that means to the accountants at the drug companies is that they can spend a lot less on patients in a trial. Because now if I have a two-fold increase in effect size that's going to cut the number of samples that I have to run through the trial in half in order to get the same effect in, and convince the FDA. And so I think as, you know, as more of these biomarker-based trials permeate um, medicine, that, that pharmas will start to realize that there will be these cases where we actually save money. Uh, you know, and, and it's yeah. going to be that kind of, I mean, that's, that's their incentive, right? Uh, um, but as long as as long as they can continue to push the drugs forward with in the absence of biomarkers, because the effect the, the general effect size is enough, it's going to be challenging. And I will but, say, but just, it's going to happen. Yeah, so. if we have as if speakers, we get to do a uh, public service announcement. I would say, you know, being able to change how we run and administer and select patients for trials based on biomarker 
is something we have to start doing a whole lot more of. I mean, numbers that we see in our CRO space is surprisingly low, like teens. That are based on file markers? Uh, of, cer of, certain, um, of certain types. I mean, like all you show those immune therapy items, that's, that's one marker, so that's really great. But a lot of the cases for these, it's still a wait and see because they want to get the trial started right now. They hope that if it's blockbuster enough, then it's A-OK. -okay. And they don't need a biomarker because the phenotype is cancer, gone, high fives for everyone. But when it doesn't work, and we know it doesn't work 70, 60 percent of the time, we know that because we're in the field, well, how do we solve that? How do we fix it? How do we make sure someone we identify someone as not being able to get that very expensive immune therapy or preventing them from getting those side effects. So I spend most of my time now, you know, begging and pleading that this extra cost of the trial actually saves this much money down the road. Um, it's a very different role, but it's something that we have to do. So if you guys know friends like, are you doing biomarker testing? You know, oh, it'd be great. Um, but there's no local congressman for that kind of stuff. But that would be, I think that's something that we need to see a whole lot more of. Um, genomic testing isn't, isn't that bad value from mining this stuff going down the road is, is better. And also interplay, I think, from these pharma databases that are so discrete, the sample volume is just ridiculous. Um, yeah. I think the other thing that has to happen is more clinical options have to be approved uh, <laughs> in order to uh, actually show the value of biomarkers to clinicians who are actively treating patients. Because now if we can do a study, if a clinician is faced with a patient with lung cancer who's failed multiple lines of therapy, and a biomarker can tell that clinician that the patient has a 10% chance or a 40% chance of responding to a certain drug, but that drug's the only option left, the clinician will prescribe that drug and not use the biomarker test and not care about the biomarker test because it doesn't change uh, his or her decision-making calculus. Whereas if, as I expect five years from now, there will be multiple combination immunotherapies available that work by different mechanisms across a number of tumor tissue types and clinicians will be faced with, oh, I have double digit possibilities to use. How do I know which one is best for my patient? That is when I think immunogenomics based biomarkers will start to shine. But in order to shine five to 10 years from now, we have to be developing them you know, yeah. yesterday. Yeah. And using them. Yes. And using them. And so I think the, in terms of being broadly applied, the field is still extremely young, but, but the work that's been do, so, done so far marks it as also extremely promising. That's the real exciting part of the, the mining aspect, this is getting to that point. Yeah. So with regards to the, the kinds of um, data sets that are available, public data sets to support um, some of these decisions um, and, and some of the research that guides these decisions. I, I, you know, we know we have clinical trials like GOV, which is not as well organized as, as some of us would like. Like a box of chocolate. <laughs> Just... um, and we have um, sequence databases, IMGT, that can tell us what uh, you know, different types of HLA sequences are out there. Um, and, and maybe we have um, some clonal repertoires. But, you know, what kinds of databases would you, if you had your dream list, um, I would like to ask each of you to think about, is there a, a data set that you wished that you had um, and that you know that uh, won't be corporate funded, um, but that might help with some of the, and I'm going to, I'm going to feed it to Vic first and say, <laughs> clinicaltrials.gov you know, if there was one extra box that people were asked of, you know, you, of 10 things that you might have in your head, what would be one of the things that you would want to have on that clinical trials like go? Explicitly listing, listing the test that's being used. Because therefore you can at least backtrack and know that test does that thing. Yeah. There's so many more, but already, yeah. as I showed earlier, it's like, we're going to look at presenting antigens. Mm -hmm. How? That's what we're going to look at. Uh, it's very difficult for me to understand which ones those are until the five years later or I go to ASCO and it shows me, oh, we are at least going to look at CTLA-4. Okay, well, I knew that. So what else? Um, so that would be the one thing, mm -hmm. just, just in clinical trials.gov that I would like to, <coughs> I would like to know. Yeah. 
can be a yeah. drop down, <laughs> something to help structure the something data a little Something forced, better. something that, uh, like mm -hmm. a CAPTCHA, it reads mm -hmm. through and said, hey, you didn't put this test ID on there. Um, I know it's kind of sometimes maybe a hard thing to do, but. Um, you, and do you have any other ones? That, oh, yeah, so at least in the, um, what, I, what, and I'm trying to do this personally uh, in my shop, is when we look at the tumor microenvironment, we're running gene expression on there, which we do for the vast majority of our, our immune therapy stuff, actually also staining it uh, in a lot of the areas that are there, uh, having more confirmation when we asked earlier about the this particular immune cell is up or not or active, you know, we have flow, we have IHC, we have NGS, to actually start building a more a better verified kind of hot and cold signature. So a database that has the RNA-seq, which everybody knows and loves, and the flow, which everybody's comfortable with and most hospitals have, and in some cases the IHC. And so you know with these, not just the phenotype for treatment, but the molecular phenotypes are known along with the genomics. That would be a, a great database. Very hard to get. I mean, some of these trials are just starting to pop up with some of those, but it's it's not easy to do, especially if it's low and you're sorting. You don't necessarily be like, oh, let me catch those, those sales. And, and, and then use for, them. The, for the uninitiated, the uninitiated flow cytometry is... Uh, you take love cells like blood, uh, you then provide an antigen there that is a floor, a color, uh, and there's a really smart camera and you basically flow the cells through capillary tubes. Once it sees it, the of course all cognition uh, camera on the flow meter, sees uh, uh, these particular colors, it shifts them down different suits and actually starts counting the cells. So the tube is thin enough to wear nothing, 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 something, nothing, nothing, something, something, something else, something else. These things actually get pretty complex, uh, so that is that is the the, the Vic version of flow cytometry, <laughs> which machine I touched in 2003 and never again. And I'm going to ask uh, you IHC. Uh, immunohistochemistry. So when you do an FFP slide, you do the same thing. It's instead of flow, you're just staining for a particular marker on the cell, and you know that cell is very specific for that very marker. So if it shows up, then there are cells of that particular type in your and, and so you showed the immunogram before, and, and there were a lot of different wedges in that pie, but yes. would it be fair to say that, that flow and IHC and genetics are... They kind of dominate this, this testing the, space the right three. now. Dominate it, absolutely. So if there was something as a data scientist that I wanted to learn about the assays so I knew what kind of data I was going to get, that might be a good place to start. It would be. Having databases of flow, that would be... I would love to know where those exist. You guys know... They don't. Know. Yeah, okay. I was going to say, I've never heard of them. Um, Cool. We'll still keep searching. Then. I'll ask Nicholas Cage in National Treasure 5 <laughs> to go find it for me. Um, so then, um, you know, let's say some, some uh, young and up-and-coming data scientist does create a flow database. Um, what kinds of uh, intellectual property issues could we talk about in terms of database ownership? Is that something that is even you know, considered in this space at this point, or is it still kind well, of very Not young? that I would know of. It's definitely, I can't imagine areas where that's identifiable either. So, yeah. But it is it is pervasive. It is everywhere. Um, so it's just something you're going to get the most out of. Mm -hmm. And there's still a lot of data in those cytometry for review. So, yeah. Yep. All right. Are there any there. questions from anyone in the room? Seems like the challenges are all around, um, you know, getting more data, different data. Like how much of your challenge is, you know, is computational? I mean, you having you mentioned the combinatorial queries and analytics and things like that. So, with a lot of the technologies that are out there today, when I talk to other I'm a former pharmacy, I, when I talk to other colleagues, they say technology is not an issue because we have the speed and the power. Would you agree with that? Or is it? Is it? Are there other things that are kind of holding you back from making progress? I think it depends on how loosely you define the term "not an issue." Yeah. You know, we don't have all the algorithmics and all the software we need and to produce the char immune characterizations from genomics data that we want. But I know, and sometimes people say that's not an issue. They mean I've got a team that can get that done in a year or two with a high degree of confidence as opposed to I have the solution in front of me right now. 
Um, but, but I mean, at least in my lab and in our work together, I would say our computational problems are not all solved. No, unless definitely you, not. Unless you solved them this morning. I'm no, 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 <laughs> not yet. But, uh, you know, to give you an example of, of where they have been solved, uh, it, it would be Lyle Mose in the back of the room here. He worked uh, up an algorithm to re reconstitute the uh, B cell receptor, which is extraordinarily complex, from RNA sequencing data. And he published that uh, last year. As part of that, we wanted to we wanted to assay the Cancer Genome Atlas set, which is about ten thousand total tumors, um, and you know constitutes I don't know a few hundred terabytes of data, uh, which would have taken you know quite a bit of resources at UNC. In fact, all of our resources, quite some amount of time. Uh, but through the use of things like Google Cloud, uh, he can get it done in a very short amount of time, simply by through you know. Uh, rapid parallelization across, you know, most Google computers on the East Coast, right? So, so there are some levels that we we you know we can tackle if it's just a magnitude of computation problem because of technologies like the cloud. However, there are other computational problems which are more algorithmic that you know in order to get to that work, it it was a year of development, you know, of algorithmic development, and so so yeah, you know, there. Even though we can we can uh, tackle some of these things just by throwing more computers at it, and those are solvable or, and, and somewhat tractable, um, there are still all the combinatorics that would even make Google's you know cloud uh, not a solution for for evaluating all combinations. And then then it comes to issues like really do we have the data even to do this with, uh, especially in some of these problems where you know the the even in linear forgetting about combinations, right, forgetting about interactions, are, are the number of features we're looking at are, are, you know, tens of folds smaller than the number of samples that we're seeing. Well, it takes an individual a long time to discover and create an algorithm, but machine learning can do that from the data. So and and, and it can if it has an endpoint that you know is true. If it has a phenotype that you've checked the bar box off of. And there's, the, there's nothing to train it. So right, so the hard part here is that, you know, in that old school kind of smear thing I showed, we know that it's relatively diverse, the immune repertoire for that patient. Well, I'm now telling you exactly what the antigens are. So how do I know that it's correct? How do I know that what my fancy assay does, what it's actually saying, is accurate? That's another thing that's hard to do. How do you go back and define the truth of what it is, orthogonally, a different technology, a different mechanism, and also something that clinicians and regulatory bodies trust? So that's why maybe this possibility for machine learning is there, but only with orthogonal testing. And since we already just described the testing in general was expensive, yet adding another one for the purposes of algorithm tuning, I've still yet to have pharma solve for me. Um, but it, 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 that creates the problem, is that you can't throw them at it because you don't, it's hard to find the truth. You can have a best guess for the truth, uh, but even then you're relying so much on these reference databases that themselves need curation. Um, we, we find bugs in them all the time, but that's okay. It's supposed to because it's part of the growing process of having these things around. We rely extensively on machine learning in order to develop these biomarkers. I mean, it's you know, sometimes the, process, the algorithms we're using are quite simple. And sometimes they're more complex, but in general, machine learning is you know is uh, is a highly utilized tool in our lab. However, what we're talking about here is really how do you get the features that the machine is going to learn from and. And that's really the challenge, and that's that's where work is needed in order because we can't just give it the raw data, even if we have all the supervision we, we can. Um, you know, there's a lot of domain-specific knowledge that goes into developing these features before they're input into the machine model uh, or into the machine learning process. Thank you. So I'm curious if there are any um, clinical trials or research studies where the immune repertoire sequencing and the tumor sequencing has been done in the same patients, and are the data sets available? Oh, no, the, yeah, they're not available, but they, they are being done. They're they available. exist, but they're not available. They're not so there, there are two, so there, there are a couple of large pharma funding trials in the immunotherapy space that have been published where RNA and DNA sequencing were done, and one of them was, um, you know, the survival curve I showed earlier was derived from one of them. Unfortunately, those data are not publicly available, and I have written emails and called authors on the study and drug company representatives, 
and gotten shut down handily over and over again. Uh, uh, well, they, they say that they did, but whether they actually, I mean, it's not in the published reports. There are two trials, two trials, one of the where uh, our immunotherapy trials with associated RNA and DNA sequencing data without Amplicon repertoire data, but where we can run our algorithms to infer TCR and BCR uh, repertoire profiles from RNA sequencing. Uh, unfortunately, one of them has 28 patients and the other has 40 patients compared to these larger pharma-funded trials where you've got hundreds of patients with Wait, clinical annotation. So it's 28 several, patients. Several thousand, yeah. With 28 yeah. patients and with, <clears throat> with 40 patients, uh, it's just not enough to do robust model building for associations with response and biomarker discovery. Now that doesn't stop people from trying. So one group published a paper where they used a, a pseudo machine learning approach uh, to perfectly classify response versus non-response in these small data sets. And I came by Joel's office and I said, Joel, what do you think of, uh, of this? And he looked at it and he says, I can't believe they published this garbage. And that was a direct quote. And so now in a presentation to my lab group, I actually had a you know, picture of Joel right? on a slide. Oh, sorry, Joel. Never mind. All right, I'll stop talking about this. <laughs> what, what Joel meant to say uh, in, his, in his excellent wit is, is this? It was an example an extre of, of extreme overfitting, and uh, you know it's not just it's not just Joel's opinion. You know, sorry to hang you out to dry no, there and, and quote you. It's, so uh, I got a second part of the question. Yeah, so I was just going to say something like uh, ECG is, is is an order then, like where you would have a large scale collection of the immune sequencing and the genomic profiling of the tumors. Mm -hmm. And if we did have something like that, what would be the best way to, or you know, what sort of biomarkers? Given that cancer, uh, immune oncology is a multi-modality, it's not just like you know PD1 or PDF1. Yeah. May I, may I Go right ahead. Say whole RNA, so you can get the HLA type. Yeah. You know, I'm going to say that. Yeah, no, thanks. Ahead, sure. Ahead, I'll, I'll, I'll take a path. <laughs> patient specific because of the HLA typing. Yeah. Whole so, RNA, you can get HLA typing. You'll be able to get it rather cheaply if you if you gather whole RNA. So if we had the PCGA like data sets, what would be the most useful biomarkers that we can come up with? Uh, if you knew that, then you'd probably be ahead of an analysis working group. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, there, there is an immune response working group that Joel and I are actually a part of for TCGA, and we are trying to answer that, that very question, but without being able to actually look in the trials in big trial data sets and figure out what correlates with response, the best that we can do and what we are doing is we're looking for the combination of immune features that best predicts, say, overall survival adjusted for tumor tissue type and other clinical factors. Right, like the, like the figure like I showed earlier with the very weak response versus the wild, you know, heavier response, that person lived two more years than the person that had the weak response. With the RNA, you can kind of get to that, get to that point. But I was actually, I'm glad you asked that because I was going to ask, ask you. Does TCA have as much like therapeutic outcome where you can do that kind of stuff? I no. can imagine you can just do risk and this is this is what I said. Survival. Like, back to Kim, you asked a minute ago, like what's the one thing that we'd add? I mean, it, this is the huge missing piece is that we have beautiful genomics data sets like TCGA that allow us to make a lot of uh, informed, you know, informed uh, I guess associations about genomics within genomics, and then you have clinical data sets. But that, that have you know some level of demographic and clinical characteristics that you can start to look at. The missing piece is really putting those two in the same. And I showed you some examples of when we have clinical data, when we have genomic data, it works well. Uh, but that's really what's missing right now. TCGA doesn't have this. Um, it wasn't the goal of TCGA, and that's why uh, we were funded in in. Uh, the, it's not supposed to be the next round of TCGA, but I forget the name. It's a new, another cancer program from the NCI where we'll actually be doing a lot of this, um, you know, global RNA and DNA sequencing for clinical trials that were designated by the NCI. But, but I'll so say we are, we, we are leveraging on. things in the TCGA where when we come up with a signature in these 40 patient, 28 patient items, we cross-reference with the prevalence of TCGA to then potentially leverage what percentage of patients from that as a, you know, marker for, let's say, melanoma, uh, potentially could get the same benefits. So there's a lot of small phase one work, 
really cool biomarker being stud, of course, with 48, it'd be tough, as you mentioned, the garbage thing would be that small and overfit on hill, but um, expanding that out with TCA, you actually start getting that what population could potentially benefit from that same area, and that's where folks like myself or even you guys can go back into pharma and say, you probably already have this data set um, and go around begging nicely like a NPR fund drive or something. But, and, <laughs> and part um, of what we're doing, you know, we, the idea is that we can use all that, the high dimensional genomics data to try to reduce it to the features that we really care about. So, you know, the, a lot of the RNA signatures are correlated with some of the protein markers and so on and so forth. So how can we distill all this down to here are the four or five things that we think we can measure clinically and, and represent the diversity of genomics that are in these larger data sets? <clears throat> Um, so, I guess if there's no more questions in the one more yeah, question. One more. Sure. Yes, absolutely. Um, so, the other thing I wanted to ask about was the toxicity related to immune oncology. So, it usually takes a long time because the immune response, I mean, you know, you're affecting the immune response and uh, the toxicity issues may not show up like, uh, you know, as soon as it, as early as it might be <coughs> or some other, you know, modality. So, um, I just wanted to get your perspective on, like, you know, you showed that durability is long, much longer, but um, but are the toxicities also being taken into account, and how is that, that being addressed? Yes, and as you might imagine, implied by what you said, a majority of the toxicities are actually autoimmune phenomena. Right. So the classical one that came with the, the first immunotherapy agent was inflammation of the colon or colitis causing severe diarrhea that mimics autoimmune disease, like Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. But you can have autoimmune thyroiditis, adrenalitis, even lung disease or, or pneumonitis. Um, and they're sort of so a multitude of autoimmune phenomena that can happen after you systemically activate the immune system to try to affect a tumor. But even, even that is still, the, the overall burden of toxicity is far less than with, say, chemotherapy. So it's still substantially better. And I think one of the things that the field has to learn over the coming years is how to best manage those complications. So if someone gets colitis from one of these drugs, um, right now we give them high dosages of steroids and taper them off and then hope it doesn't, it doesn't come back. Is that good enough? Is there a better therapy for that? Same thing for the the thyroid disease or adrenal gland disease or lung disease uh, and so on. So I think it remains to be seen what the best therapies are, but there are autoimmune toxicities. The overall quality of life and mortality burden is still far less than with chemotherapy. Great question. Um, so thank you again to our panelists and, and uh, would you have closing remarks? kind of sum up the takeaway if there's something that you wanted to leave a thought with our data scientists um, who are newly blessed with all this immuno-oncology information. Yeah, even outside the immuno-oncology information, the constru I mean, if we're going to really start to link clinical databases in the patient and their marker history or their testing history with genomics, don't quote, genomics is a thing, but linking it, I think, is, is where I'm putting the quotes in. Uh, we don't have a, there's just not a solution that I, I've seen, maybe it does exist, where you're marrying the patient clinical information, which we need to get the survivability, we need to know what drugs they were put on, and then all this wealth of genomics. As I mentioned earlier, we have pharma just say, just throw that exome and RNA-seq into our clinical trial database, it'll be great. And you can't because you're clowning them several orders of magnitude beyond what the database can hold. But if there is such a mechanism that can dynamically link those yes, things, then that would be, that, that, is, that is a challenge that I don't think is, is yet solved, even by a lot of these large data companies um, that I'll remain nameless. But I still haven't seen, I think, a solution that is going to yield the outcome that everybody anticipates from having these kinds of discussions undergrad if that like, oh you could do that and then it'd be great. There's just not a mechanism to do it. The infrastructure to support what the physician needs and what the researcher needs in one place is just wholly unsolved. I think it's a very exciting time, but we in summary we need more data and and we need better algorithms for feature selection at the same time. And we already have petabytes of 
Maybe even activates. Well, well, I think it's more of the data of patients, sequencing data from patients who are on immunotherapy trials with robust clinical annotation. Pharma companies have it for big trials and aren't releasing it. And so we need either to convince the NIH to give us, you know, millions of dollars to do these studies on the large trials that the NIH is supporting, or we need to make make really good friends convince with the pharma guys. Pharma to release release the data. Um, that would be like yeah. just taking one of their child as a ward for you know seventeen yeah. years. If I had a solution to that problem, I would have already executed it. You'd, yeah, you'd have been you'd have been have some you know not events of startup. Be like, look at me, because that would be amazing. Yeah. Joel, do you have? Um, you know, not much. Say, yeah, data, right? no, no, what's that? <laughs> more data, right? Yeah, yeah, you know, it's hard enough to analyze the data that we have. I would take, I would take well annotated data over more data any day of the week, just mm -hmm. as Ben and, and yeah. Vic alluded to, and yeah. and uh, I think really that's the key is is to figure out some way where we can get you know better annotated data, not just more data, and. And so this has been alluded to, this happens in a couple different ways, it's either, you know, government sponsored research or it's uh, figuring out a business model that makes it attractive for the pharmaceutical companies to, to, to you know, allow others to, to dig into their data. Um, and, uh, but neither one of those is happening right now and uh, because, that, you know, there's just, it's either too expensive or it's too much of a risk. and. That's really limiting. Now, but speaking to a, just a data science perspective, that that doesn't mean that we should just stop. That doesn't mean that we should. Oh, we can't get to the good data, so we're going to quit. Um, there's still enormous opportunity to take the data that are available, um, and and companies are already doing this from a just looking at public data. So there is there is you know good knowledge to be had of of whether it's going into hospitals that are willing and linking up clinical data with treatment schedules um, or taking a, and then going through and sequencing those samples, right, and kind of putting together, figuring out here's a cohort that I can access. What, what data can I, what data can I, you know, bring into this cohort in order to make it the goal that I want? And, and so that, that's happening. I think that's, um, that's an exciting part. But back to the data science part, I think the you know, we should continue to look for ways to, to aggregate data, either through, you know, old school record linkage or, or newer ways of, of, of using technology in order to figure out cohort level associations and matching up, um, whether it be on genetic ancestry or who knows what, right, in order to, to make predictions about uh, folks that are going to respond to these drugs that, that can be tested. So I think there's many opportunities. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been fantastic. Great information. I know I've learned a lot. I appreciate you being here. Thanks. Thank you. We have a few more announcements from the South Big Data Innovation Hub, so if you hang on for five minutes. Uh, the South Hub will be opening up application process for the program to empower partnerships with industry and government starting tomorrow. So companies and government agencies are interested in data science faculty, postdocs, and graduate students. For up to 12 weeks in the summer, uh, they will post descriptions of the internships and uh, residencies available on southbigdatahub.org as of tomorrow, Friday, April 14th. So that's the PEPI program in its second year. Uh, the Big Data Hub, as you may know, uh, was awarded um, $3 million in Microsoft Azure credits along with training and technical supports. Uh, the South Hub is getting 750,000 of those uh, Azure credits which will be opening up the competition for those quite soon. As part of that, uh, Vani Mandava of Microsoft Research will be, uh, she and her colleagues will be presenting on what Azure Compute could do for our hub members. Uh, so be sure to check that out on the Data Sharing and Infrastructure Working Group meeting uh, Friday, April 28th from 3 to 4.30 p.m. Uh, Globus will also be presenting at that time. Again, go to our website for that, southbigdatainnovationhub.org. Um, there will be a free Microsoft Azure training workshop, full day, up in Washington, D.C. on June 8th. Uh, the same day, the South Hub will be having a workshop at Intel on artificial intelligence. And then the next day, on June 9th, the South Hub will be hosting its second annual all-hands meeting uh, at Microsoft uh, facility in Friendship Heights, right, right off the metro. 
So we'll be announcing the hold the date and register shortly. Uh, the amazing Sarah Davis will be sending that message out to you all. Uh, so stay tuned for detail, details. And lastly, if you haven't seen it already, the National Science Foundation has issued the call for proposals for the next round of spoke proposals as part of the hub. Those grant awards go from anywhere from 100, 200,000 to up to a million. Uh, it is looking for cross-sector partnerships and connecting data scientists with domain scientists and practitioners for real-world applications. Uh, there are, it's a limited uh, competition, meaning that each institution, each university can only submit one. So the universities are now having inter internal competition, so look for an earlier deadline. The NSF deadline is September 18th, and you will need to obtain a letter of collaboration from your hub uh, by June I think, 19th. So look for an FAQ that's coming out, but the call for proposals announcements is already out there. So with that, thank you to Kimberly for a fantastic panel, and thank you for our distinguished guests who have joined us today. Those of you who are in the room, please feel free to come up and talk to our guests at the end. Thank you very much. Thank you.